Good evening and welcome to uh, St George's House In Conversation, the first conversation of our new season. Uh, I'm delighted that so many of you are able to join us uh, online tonight. Uh, and I do hope that if uh, any questions occur to you in the course of the conversation, that you will send them through to me on the chat facility. And I'll do my very best to, uh, to weave them in. Um, it is a particular pleasure and indeed an honor to have as our guest tonight, Lord King, uh, Mervyn King, leading economist, former governor of the Bank of England, uh, a firm friend of St. George's House and author also of the book I hope you can see behind me, The, the End of Alchemy, uh, which looked at the financial sector in 2008 and the crisis that occurred then, but also makes some radical suggestions as to how the financial world might be better organized, better run uh, in, in the future. Uh, I think you'll agree it could not be a better time to have somebody of Lord King's distinction. Uh, we are living in a time of volatility in the markets once again. Uh, the Chancellor's fiscal event slash mini budget, whatever it might be called, seems to have set things a jitter. We have a cost of living crisis, we have inflation heading into double digits, and we have interest rates on the way up uh, uh, after a long period of very low interest rates. And I'm sure we will come to all of that in due course. But Lord King, firstly, welcome uh, tonight. Thank you for making the time to be with us. And I really wanted to take you back uh, to 2008. I've, I've had a, a great time with your book. Um, and the, one of the things that occurred to me as I read it was, this was a huge, huge crisis, uh, but yet nobody seemed to see it coming. And, and I wonder if that says something about economics as a discipline uh, in itself. And how come the brilliant economic minds that were, were in the sector at the time really didn't see this coming over the hill? And when it came, it came very quickly. Well, first, Gary, thank you very much for inviting me to join you in this conversation. St. George's House and St. George's Chapel are a very important part of my life. So the financial crisis, why did people not see it coming? That, of course, was the question which the Queen posed to economists at the London School of Economics. Now, of course, some people claim they did see it coming, and there are always people who will forecast either you know, doom and gloom or great optimism, and they claim to be right after the event. I think a lot of people did understand that what was developing uh, in the 12 months or two years or so before the crisis really broke in August 2007, that that position was unsustainable. But the fact that you could see that there were major problems in the financial system didn't enable you to say, ah, it'll be the first week of August 2007 that it all goes wrong. And indeed, if people did believe that, it almost certainly would have either gone wrong earlier than that, or they would have been able to take measures to prevent it. So I, I don't think it's, it's terribly productive to say, why did no one see that particular event occurring? I think it's much more that people were complacent about the build-up of excess borrowing in the financial sector and the use of very complex instruments, which they didn't really understand. And uh, I remember I gave a speech at the Mansion House in June 2007, before the crisis hit. And I said that you know, the experience of history was that financial crises were associated with excessive leverage, that is banks and other financial bodies borrowing too much, and that many of these complex instruments might turn out to look a good deal less attractive when the time came to get the returns. And I remember that there was a section of the audience that booed at that point. And they booed because they were very keen to maintain this fiction that because the banking system, the financial system in London was so efficient and profitable, that there must be nothing wrong with it. 
But of course, one way of making high profits is that by taking a lot of risk. And one of the checks ought to be on any institution that you know, are, are we making a lot of money? If so, let's stop congratulating ourselves. Let's work out whether it's because we're taking too much risk. And that was exactly what happened with Bering when it failed. Um, and you know, the mid 90s, the collapse of Bering's occurred because they couldn't really understand why they seemed to be making so much money in Singapore. And it turned out, of course, that the money they were making was only on paper and it, they ultimately made large losses. So uh, and there is a real sense in which people are deeply reluctant to face up to the fact that success that they're seeing may not be the result of their own genius, but the result of either luck or just taking too much risk. Right. And, and how close do you think we came to collapse, to total collapse? Well, I think we did. Uh, I mean, my opposite number, Ben Bernanke at the Federal Reserve, said that if it hadn't been for central banks stepping in, every major financial institution in New York would have failed. I don't think it was quite as bad as that in London. I think most of the major banks would have failed. Um, but there was a gradation. <clears throat> um, but undoubtedly, it would have been immensely serious because, you know, if, if you imagine the ATMs closing down, if you discover that you can't make your mortgage payment, so you lose your credit rating because you can't make a transfer through your bank, if you can't receive your salary because the bank can't credit your account, if all those things happen, then it's a bit like the equivalent of electricity being turned off. The whole system starts to creak and breaks down. So I think the economy would have come close to collapse had we not intervened to try and do something about the stability of the banking system. Yeah, and uh, I mean, the interventions worked, but I suppose the question people might ask now is, where are lessons learned? Is there a danger we could go into this again? Well, I don't think we'll have a, the same crisis again. It's a good question whether lessons were learned. I don't think they've been learned sufficiently. Interestingly, one of the big lessons that people should have taken away was that it's not enough just to have a profitable industry. It also has to be resilient to various unexpected events that come along. And for banks, it's easy to know the answer. <coughs> they have to have enough, have issued enough shareholders' capital so that there are people who can absorb losses that may occur. And banks need to be able to provide the central bank with enough good collateral so that the central bank <coughs> will lend to them. And uh, making the system more resilient is in large part what's been done since the crisis. But when, of course, it came to COVID, we discovered that the importance of resilience wasn't just for the financial system. It applied also to the health system, and it applies to a wide range of businesses. So businesses that thought that having a just-in-time delivery was a good idea, suddenly realized that borders can close quite quickly, and then you need another source of supply. And if you've relied solely on just in time from the cheapest source, many thousands of miles away, then you may find yourself unable to carry on producing. And that is a big lesson. I think the theme of resilience is crucially important. And it's one that's going to have quite a big effect, I think, on the structure of our economy as we come out of COVID and think about how to organize businesses, public services, and where we need to make investments. Right. And, and in the book as well, you, you talk in some detail about the importance of trust. Um, you know, money is based on trust. <coughs> Banks were institutions that rely on trust. Do you think has that trust been, if not lost, certainly weakened? <coughs> Well, it was certainly lost uh, in large part, I think, around the time of the financial crisis. And you could see that because even the big banks in the UK found it very difficult to borrow short term because no one really knew whether they'd made or lost money in the transactions on derivative instruments before the crisis. 
And if you didn't know which bank was winning and which bank was losing, you didn't want to lend to any of them because uh, then the, your loans would just never be repaid. So that trust was lost. And I think one of the um, unfortunate aspects of the rise in inflation is that the whole point of having a stable currency is that people trust it, they're willing to make transactions in terms of that currency, they will price their goods and their wage and their labor in terms of that, that currency. And they can trust that it won't see its value be too volatile. And I think it's very unfortunate that we've seen the rise in inflation that we have seen. I think that can be corrected, but trust is the fundamental mainstay of a market economy and indeed any society. It isn't, you can't just rely on incentives to persuade people to behave in a way that generates the best results collectively. We all trust the people that we deal with. Um, you, you trust people when you buy food in a shop. You, you trust that you don't have to test whether it's, you don't have to have your own poison expert next to you to taste the food first. Many things that we do in life rely on trust. You trust a bus driver not to crash it into the other side of the road. And, and uh, all of these things rely on a combination of trust in other people, trust in the regulatory and legal framework within which we all operate. But it's not something that you can simply rely on pieces of paper. Uh, it was once said that you know, if that's the view of what a rational economist is, that no economist would ever be able to reproduce themselves because nobody would want to marry someone that was as completely absurdly legalistically rational as that. Humans are what make our society work, not textbook economists. Right. And, and you said there that the, the inflation on the rise at the moment, you think that can be corrected. How, how do you think it can be corrected? Well, the simple answer is higher interest rates. I think what was very unfortunate was that during the period of very low interest rates after the financial crisis, until COVID hit, inflation was low. There was no obvious reason to think that it might deviate from that. And I think not just central banks, but I think the economics profession deluded itself into a theory of inflation that said inflation doesn't really depend on the amount of money in the economy or what's going on. What it depends on is people's expectations. And those expectations are determined by the official inflation target. Now, this is circular, because if you really believe that, then by definition, any deviation of inflation from the target must be transitory, because people's beliefs will always bring it back to target. They will behave in a way consistent with it. But when inflation starts to rise rapidly, why should they go on believing that inflation will always come back to 2%? The model that economists and central banks were using said it would, but it didn't correspond to common sense. And what we saw during COVID was that and we started with a, with a balance of the economy, but with demand and supply roughly equal. Yeah. And then with the lockdowns and decisions by businesses, supply was at least temporarily reduced. And what did central banks do? They printed a lot of money so that demand rose. But demand was then exceeding supply. You have the classic uh, definition of inflation resulting from too much money chasing too few goods. Right. COVID gave us too few goods. Central banks gave us too much money. And it was the old, th it was this newfangled theory that somebody didn't need to worry about what was happening to money or in the economy. You just looked at expectations. And that would guarantee that inflation would come back to target. Well, it didn't. And it got out of hand. And then, of course, central banks had bad luck because the Russian invasion of Ukraine added to a significant rise in inflation that had already was occurring and was very visible in 2021. Um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine pushed up world food and energy prices, which took inflation up again to around 10%, not just in the UK, but in the European Union and in the United States. Now, what will bring it down? Well, <clears throat> first of all, if there is some good news in Ukraine, about the war in Ukraine, not easy to 
imagine that, but let's suppose there were some resolution of the war in Ukraine, which meant that food and energy prices came back to their pre-invasion level. Then instead of energy prices adding, say, four percentage points to the annual headline inflation rate, it would for a year deduct, subtract four percentage points. So if the underlying inflation rate re resulting from the printing too much money in 2020-21 took inflation up from, say, 2 to 6%, but instead of energy prices taking it from 6 to 10, they'd be taking it from 6 back to 2 yeah. for a year. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> That would unwind after a year, but that would require a lot of luck. So... You know, you could imagine a scenario in which the government does get lucky and inflation does fall very sharply, collapses back to the target. That would not be the result of good policy. It would, would be the result of good luck. You can't rule it out. It doesn't seem the most likely outcome, but it is possible. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, central banks will clearly have to deal with the underlying inflationary component, which is high and it just shows no signs yet of falling back. And it's resulting from wage increases, obviously, as employers need to offer higher wages to people in order to attract the labour that they want. And one of the problems that we've got, which resulted from COVID, which I think was not easily predictable, was that we all thought that with the furlough scheme, the links between employers and their employees would be maintained, even if they weren't working and producing, because of the furlough scheme. And once we got out of that, then people just carry on working as they were before. But what's happened is that around half a million or so people have disappeared from the labor force. And many of these are over 50. Many of them self-identify as long-term sick. We simply do not know whether ultimately they will come back into the labor force. They may decide that the change in lifestyle is sufficiently enjoyable to compensate for the lower income. Uh, they may be people who have been added to the NHS waiting list, which is clearly very long, and don't want to work until they've had their treatment. So they might come back eventually, but only when the NHS has treated them. Or they may be suffering from symptoms of long COVID, about which we don't know very much, and who knows how long those symptoms will last. Yeah. And I see no easy way in which we can anticipate that. We just have to watch and see. But what it does mean is that starting from here with a very tight labour market, it's going to be extremely difficult to bring down the domestically generated component of inflation without higher interest rates that will generate some slack in the labour market that mean that firms won't have to offer higher wages in order to get the labour they need. Right. And, and just going back to something you said a moment ago, um, the central banks printing more money during COVID at a time when uh, the, the, the economy, as it were, was closing down, parts of the market were closing down. That seems to me, as a non-economist, a very basic error. It was a very basic error. <laughs> and I think most non-economists wouldn't have made it. But if you're a very clever economist, and you have these fancy models which say, inflation is driven by expectations, expectations are equal to the target, then you don't ask yourself the question, but why would people believe that inflation is going back to the target when they can quite obviously see that it isn't? Uh, and that was something which I think central banks realised only belatedly. The Federal Reserve has turned around quite sharply now and basically is saying we'll do whatever it takes, even if it means a recession in order to bring inflation back down. The US inflation numbers today were not encouraging. They will keep raising rates until they're pretty much convinced that inflation will come back to the target. We don't know what the Bank of England will do. So far, it's not been willing to raise rates as quickly as the Fed. Uh, I think it's clear that given recent events, at least some members of the Monetary Policy Committee would like to make a significant jump in interest rates to start to bring inflation down but we'll know more when they meet again in early november and just picking up on a question that has come through to me uh, and i know you won't do this because i know it's not your form to advise your successors but um from a 
a, a kind of a, a neutral position, what what would your advice or approach be in the current environment? <laughs> I wouldn't start from here. Would be my <laughs> advice. Um, and I think this is one of the problems because having allowed inflation to pick up uh, in the way that it has, much higher than we've experienced for a long time, I think central banks will now feel that they will want to err on the side of ensuring that inflation comes down. The idea of trying to navigate a fine path between recession and inflation, I think is out of the window now. I think that's <clears throat> too late for that. And I think that certainly in the case of the Fed and my guess is other central banks will feel that they cannot afford to lose credibility and they will want to be tough on inflation. That may be, mean that if all central banks are doing it, that collectively they overdo it and we end up with a, a global recession. But maybe we need that in order to bring inflation back to the target. Of course, some good luck in the form of resolution of the war in Ukraine would help enormously. Mm -hmm. But short of that, uh, I think central banks will just keep going. And that does raise the risk of a recession down the road. Yeah, and just thinking, you know, about inflation uh, and interest rates, how high do you think they could go? I mean, could we get back to the 1970s, for example? I don't think we're in a position where rates will need to go to, say, 15 percent. No. <clears throat> um, but remember, in the 1970s, inflation in Britain actually reached 27 percent. And we're not in that position now. Um, but that's the reason why it's important that central banks tackle this early. The big mistake made in the 1970s was to think that, well, it doesn't really matter, inflation's a bit higher. You know, we, we need to keep unemployment down, so we'll tolerate a somewhat higher level of inflation. That simply didn't work. And the central banks that pursued that approach ended up with not only higher inflation, but actually much longer recessions. Yeah. And it was the Bundesbank and the Swiss National Bank who went into this early and decided they would tackle inflation early that ended up with lower inflation and much shorter recessions. Mm -hmm. And just thinking for a moment about uh, the regulatory system. I mean, there seems to be a, a move at the moment to deregulate. Uh, and I think of things like the recent flurry of news around bankers' bonuses and all of that. Um, do you, do you think there is a danger that we won't control, banks won't be properly controlled? Well, what we need is intelligent regulation. And I despair sometimes of you know, what happens when people introduce new regulations. So in the financial sector with banking, the regulations are tens of thousands of pages long. Now, there's a certain madness to this. And... It means that instead of changing the culture of what goes on in a bank, anyone working in a bank, all they can do really is to go to their compliance officer and say, look, I don't understand the regulation. I've got a job to do. I don't have time to read tens of thousands of pages. Tell me whether, whether I want, what I want to do is kosher or not. And um, that doesn't lead to a culture in which you want people to say, ask themselves, am I... And what the strategy I want to pursue is, is the product I want to sell a customer the right thing or the wrong thing to do? And you want that sense of self-responsibility to be generated. You can't do that when you've got an incredibly detailed regulatory system. So regulation has to be, I think, a lot simpler. A banker's bonuses is quite a good example of it because, frankly, it didn't actually achieve very much. It doesn't now. Uh, and have greater competition among banks, uh, regulation on the overall degree of risk that's being taken. You don't want banks to borrow too much money themselves. Simpler regulation that works makes sense. We saw in the financial crisis that there were very detailed calculations about the amount of equity capital that banks had to issue. And they were so detailed and complicated that they were useless in the financial crisis because they were designed using data from a period before the financial crisis. And they didn't pick up, pick up the risks that banks were taking immediately before the financial crisis. 
the one thing that we always need to remember is that the world isn't just the playing out of the same old forces year in, year out. It's not like tossing a coin. Sometimes it's heads, sometimes it's tails. The world is always changing. And that's very different from many scientific laws. You know, the motion of the planets around the sun can be predicted with fairly straightforward calculations because the forces that are determining it are not really changing much over time. Whereas in the economy, the forces driving the economy are changing over time. And of course, people react to that, which makes forecasting and prediction almost impossible. And it's much better to try and have simple rules of thumb, if you like, for behavior and for regulation. So we need regulation, that's absolutely true, but we need, I think, much simpler, but more intelligent regulation. Okay, and I'm just looking at some of the questions which are coming through thick and fast, as you as you might as you might imagine. And one here is: Do you feel that banks are still attempting to influence financial regulations? And if so, to what degree? I think almost any um, company or large producer is trying to influence the regulator and the politicians that set regulations. That is always true, and it was very clear before the financial crisis, and it's equally true now that people will lobby for their own self-interest. At one level, you can't complain about that. Sometimes the lobbying will bring to the attention of politicians and regulators some facts which they may not be aware of, but it's, it's always an important consideration. And from that perspective, I do worry that the government wants to give the Bank of England a remit for financial regulation that includes the competitiveness of the City of London. That's not the job of the regulator. Uh, the Treasury or some other government department can be responsible for promoting a particular industry like financial services. The regulator's job is to take the regulations designed by Parliament and implement them without fear or favour. And that's one of the most important things. Right. And there has been talk, how serious, it's hard to tell, but about the independence of the Bank of England uh, and, and tampering with that. Do you think that is at all likely? I don't think there is any likely threat to the legal independence of the Bank of England. I think any government that tried to <clears throat> get rid of the independence of the Bank of England for monetary policy would immediately see an adverse reaction in uh, in, in gilt markets and long-term borrowing rates for the government. But I do think there is a big issue about de facto or practical independence. And I think it comes from, from two sources. One is the fact that when the Bank of England was made independent in 1997, there were still a lot of people working in the bank and people in politics who remembered the inflation of the 1970s. And they realized that mistakes were made and they knew that it was in their interest to allow the bank to set interest rates independently. And that they as politicians would in the long run benefit from that. Now there's hardly anyone left now in this, either in banking or in politics who remember the 1970s personally. And too many people have got used to an artificial situation in which interest rates have been so close to zero. That is not a sustainable position. That means that as interest rates go up, which they are now, that's a global phenomenon, not just a UK one, that people will discover that the cost of their mortgages goes up. Politicians won't like that. The cost of servicing government debt is rising. Politicians won't like that. And there will be a temptation for them to put pressure on the Bank of England to help them ease the challenge of financing these large budget deficits. So a combination of the lack of, you know, there's no memory now of how bad inflation was and why independence was important and the practical pressures on government to finance their budget deficits today means I think that they will want to put more pressure on the Bank of England and they can do that in a variety of ways. Um, you know, appointments, um, putting the people in the bank who may want to see there. Uh, there are all 
kinds of ways that can be done. And I think one of the things that's not helping in this respect is that when the bank was made independent in 1997, the, the government said, well, that, that's your job. You're not supposed to do anything else. And there's a lot to be said for that. And I think since then, the, so many responsibilities have been put back onto the Bank of England, including most recently climate change, which is really very foolish because central banks can't do very much about climate change. Yes, they can create a massively costly reporting system, which generates lots of spreadsheets, but doesn't really mean anything or do anything. Climate change is too important to play with that. Governments have a responsibility for it. They should take the measures and steps that are needed to combat it, not pretend that there's something that central banks can do. Nobody would ever create a central bank because they were worried about climate change. They created central banks because they wanted a stable currency and a stable financial system. And the, as soon as you load more responsibilities on the bank, which are properly those of governments, governments quite naturally come to feel, well, hang on a minute, we should be involved in this decision too. And that blurs then the boundary between politics and central banks in a way that's not very helpful. And on the eve of the uh, Brexit referendum, I remember you gave a lecture at St. George's House and in St. George's Chapel. And uh, you began by saying that you were absolutely not going to tell the audience which way you planned to vote the next day. And I'm not going to ask you tonight which way you did vote the I'm next day. You. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do want to ask you, here we are, whatever it is, six years on. How do you feel from an economic point of view, Brexit, is shaping up for the UK? Well, the, the main point I wanted to make uh, at the time was that Brexit, in my view, was primarily a political issue, a very important political issue, rather than an economic one. And I still hold to the view that 25 years from now, when we look back, I think, it, I can't be sure, no one can, it's very uncertain, but my guess is that we'll conclude that Brexit didn't really transform the British economy in either direction. You know, we're not this dynamic economy like Singapore, because leaving the EU did not mean that we became Singapore. And equally, the idea that we would all be £3,500 worse off was also, you know, something you couldn't possibly know that. It was propaganda. And since it didn't really, you know, that we didn't have very large tariffs through leaving even if we were to leave without a deal. There's no obvious reason why it should make a dramatic difference. Now, it would make a difference to one or two sectors, agriculture perhaps being the most important. That's the long run impact. Now, what we've seen so far since the referendum is I think two things. One, a total mismanagement of the process of going from the referendum to actually leaving and recreating a new relationship with the, with the EU. I mean, it really was mismanaged. The idea that you then open a negotiation and announce that under no circumstances will we have no deal, and we're not going to even prepare for that, automatically hands all the negotiating power to the other side. Mm -hmm. So that was extraordinarily foolish. The whole mess about the Northern Ireland Protocol was quite absurd. I think there were better ways of doing it. But having signed a protocol, which is an international treaty, you can't then turn around and say to people, oh, there are no, no obstacles to movement of goods from the UK to Northern Ireland, when the protocol says there will be, and then decide, well, okay, I may have promised that we'd do that, but I'm just going to abandon my promises and renege on an international treaty. That's not a way to create happier relationships with the other side. And things, simple things like, you know, we are, go back to resilience. I mean, Dover is far too dominant in our trade of goods. This is not something which resulted from Brexit. It was true before, and it was a problem before, and we have not done enough to deal with the resilience of excessive reliance on Dover. Um, that's a small example of things where we simply didn't prepare properly. So that's the first set of issues. The second though, which is probably even more important, is that the impacts of COVID and now the invasion of Ukraine are much more important on the UK economy than the first few years outside the EU. So the impact of Brexit has just been dominated 
by COVID, the response to that, uh, and now the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So I think it's just impossible to assess what the short run economic impact has been. Yeah. And, you know, but yet again, people, you know, if, if you want to, to know uh, whether someone is going to tell you that Brexit's been economically very costly or has been an opportunity which is yet to be grasped, you just need to ask what their politics are. Yeah. And that will tell you. And there is a very interesting uh, statement in A.J.P. Taylor's book on the origins of the Second World War, where he looks at experts advising governments on the military buildup prior to the Second World War. And he ends up by concluding, it's always important to remember that every expert has a political viewpoint. And I think that people, too many experts get seduced into pretending to know more than they can possibly know because they want to convince people that they've got the answer. And I think they underestimate people. I think people want to know what experts think, because, but they understand that experts can't understand everything or know everything. This was true in COVID. And when the government was saying, and we must do what the science tells us to do, science doesn't tell you what to do. Science always is a matter of un uncertainty and challenge. And Science can be very helpful in framing a problem and understanding it. When we get a completely new virus, it doesn't actually tell you precisely what you should do. And when it comes to human behavior and the reactions to a lockdown, there's no way that the science can tell you how we're all going to respond to it. Yeah. And, and we need to take that into account, and people will understand that. They understand that many decisions are made in a world of uncertainty, and they want to be helped by giving but honest information, not dishonest information. Yeah, and I suppose some people would argue and do argue that COVID and the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine have given the government cover uh, for Brexit. Uh, you know, if those two things hadn't happened, we'd have a clearer picture of where Brexit was going. Well, that's probably true, but I don't think that enables us to know what would have happened if we hadn't had COVID or the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I don't, I don't think many politicians would welcome that kind of cover. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't <laughs> think been, I don't think it's been a terribly pleasant experience for them coping with COVID yeah. and now the invasion. And, and just thinking again to, uh, to reading your book, you, you, you were studying economics in the 60s. I mean, how have you seen the discipline of economics change in the course of your, in the course of your lifetime? Yes, it has. It, it, uh, it has become... Uh, much more specialised. You, you've got specialities where people do their own thing and don't talk to people in other parts of the discipline, or at least don't feel free to challenge them. Um, it has also, I think, become much more divorced from other social sciences. So John Kay and I wrote a book recently on radical uncertainty. And one of the big mistakes, I think, of of macroeconomics related to what I explained earlier is that if you simply write down a model, the point of a model is deliberately to abstract from the complications of the world and to home in on one issue only so you can get your head around it. Models are incredibly helpful for giving you intuition about how markets might work, how macroeconomics might work. What models are not is a literal description of the world. And that's why you can't use models to make forecasts or predictions because the world is much too complex. Models are to help you think about the world, to frame problems. But what too many economists have done is to believe that their models are a description of the world. And so they set policy in the model. And I, I remember when I wrote a report on the performance of the Swedish central bank, the Riksbank. And what was so striking was that the people on the committees were very adamant that they should really try to tell people where interest rates were going to go three years from now. Now, if I try to tell you, Gary, tonight, that I, I, I'm really confident that this is where banks are going to set interest rates three years from now, you'd say, but how can you possibly know? And you'd be right, 
But it didn't stop economists thinking that as long as you told people where interest rates were going three years from now, then they'd believe it and that would condition their behavior. Um, frankly, I think most people look at it and thought, this is just nonsense. And it was, and it turned out that even the disagreements among the committee at the Ricks Bank turned out to be complete, uh, both sides of the debate were way off, way off, because they weren't actually asking what are the big things going on in the world? For them, it was a, a crisis in the euro area, which meant that interest rates in the euro area were much lower than they'd expected them to be. That was what drove the difference between their forecasts and reality. But they just focused on the model. And that's a terrible mistake. And it's that focus on excessive focus on models, I think, that's or the misuse of models. Models are very important and useful, but they, they can be misused and are often misused in the context of public policy. And, and just thinking right up to date now, looking at the, the current chancellor and the recent mini budget fiscal event, I mean, that, that has got this new wave of government off to a very shaky start. Do you think that that can be settled in some way or are we heading into, into stormy, stormy weather? So I think it's important to separate the political hysteria in a way about all this from the underlying economics. Uh, it's clear that the government will need now to produce a budget on the 31st of October, which demonstrates that although we are going to be borrowing a lot of money over the next couple of years, in large part to pay for the energy price cap, that in years to come, the ratio of national debt to national income will begin slowly but steadily to fall back because that's the right, in a normal year, you want that ratio to be falling <clears throat> so that when some crisis occurs, you can allow it to jump up again to finance, whether it's war expenditure or COVID expenditure, doesn't matter. We don't, we, these crises are not happening every other year. And so in normal times, that ratio of debt to national income has come down. That is the lodestar for a sensible fiscal policy. They've got to add that to what they want to do on taxes and spending overall. And the mistake that was made was, I understand why they wanted to announce the energy price cap very, very quickly. That was not crazy. But the problem was that they also announced a range of other measures without waiting for a budget where they could demonstrate that they had a plan for bringing debt to GDP back down at some point. That's what they've got to do now. And they've rather, they've rather boxed themselves in, clearly. Um, but we shouldn't forget that underlying all this, there's a great deal of, of hysteria, really, about what's going on in financial markets. That the, the two things which the British economy needs and has needed for quite a long while to deal with the fact that we simply don't save enough as a country are higher interest rates, higher long-term interest rates, to provide a return on savings and to enable pension funds to meet the cost of paying pension and a somewhat weaker exchange rate because we have a very large current account deficit. We import a lot more than we export. And so we effectively borrow from abroad. So we've got to raise how much we save. Well, what we've got higher interest rates now, not just at the short end set by the Bank of England, but longer term interest rates have risen. Many people will find this an awkward adjustment and asset prices will fall back. But it's an important and necessary step, as is a somewhat weaker exchange rate. People always look at this sterling dollar rate, that's highly misleading. The exchange rate against a, a basket of other countries, weighted by the amount we trade with them, has fallen 6% or so, not a great deal since the beginning of August, not trivial, but it was probably part of the adjustment. So we are going back to a world in which interest rates will be higher. And the oddity is not that people should be worried about the rise in interest rates. They should be more worried about the damage that was done by having excessively low interest rates in the last you know, eight or nine years. Uh, they were needed at the, during the financial crisis, but nobody around the tables of the international meetings at the time uh, 
ever believed that we would have to have these excessively low interest rates for anything more than a you know, reasonably short period. And they've just gone on and gone on. And that's a big challenge for the world economy. It's not for the UK, it's for the world economy. So there are big changes going on in the world. We're going back to a world of higher interest rates. That's bound to mean that asset prices will fall back relative to incomes. We can't stand in the way of that. We have to accept it and adapt. But in the longer run, it will be to our benefit. That's a, such an interesting analysis. And lastly, and I'm going to take you away from all this completely, but uh, one of our uh, listeners mentioned the charity you found a chance to shine uh, based on your love of cricket, which your well-known love of cricket. Uh, and I think people are interested just to know what the charity does and how it's doing, how it's going. Well, the charity was set up to reinvigorate cricket in state schools. Uh, state schools had stopped doing not just cricket, but many other sports. And we wanted to put cricket, as I say we, as Mark Nicholas, the cricket commentator and myself, 20 years ago started this. And we wanted to do this as an educational project, not as a cricket project. So our motto was, ask not what children can do for cricket, but what cricket can do for children. And what we thought cricket could do for children was to give them real, really valuable lessons in life skills. So learning how to win and how to lose, how to cope with these different things, how to compete fiercely on the pitch, but be friends with your opponents off it, how to work in a team, how to take responsibility for your own performance, when you are working amongst a group, how to keep fit, the importance of physical fitness. All of these things we thought were very important life skills. And we thought cricket was probably the best sport we could think of to do that. So we, we set up Chance to Shine. It's uh, gone very well. Head teachers love it. They bring it into the schools. We train the teachers. We bring in coaches from cricket clubs outside into the schools, both in the, uh, the, 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 day, the teaching day and also outside school hours. Um, and we organize proper competitive matches. The scheme has been very successful that over 5 million children have gone through this program. Biggest sports program, I think, in, in British history. It's been immensely successful. Um, and it carries on. There are still, because each year more children enter the school system, we've got to keep the program going and add to those numbers. So um, it, it's, it, it's operating very successfully. We have a very professional team now running this. Uh, and everyone believes in its success. I think although the MCC and the England and Wales Cricket Board were sceptical at the beginning of this venture, because they'd seen so many ideas about how to generate these projects, start but then disappear with the, the kit left in a cupboard somewhere and everyone's forgotten about it. They were skeptical, they, they, were, they didn't think it would work. So we knew that we had to have really professional management and it had to be a system that we, we monitored uh, every week, we monitored what was going on in the different schools around the country. And we actually threw out some clubs providing coaches from the programme because they weren't doing, they weren't matching the standards we'd set. That really affected how people behave. And, and it's, I, I, I'm extremely proud of this because it's had a big effect. And we, we see the stories from head teachers about kids who had dropped out of school, um, were not performing well, couldn't concentrate. Once they had discovered that there was something that they could do, which wasn't just academic work, and they were good at it, then some of these people became leaders of the school. Uh, and would encourage other kids to study their academic work, not just play sport. You know, one girl said to me when I went to a school in Kent, um, once Charles to Shine has shown me that I could play cricket. Well, maybe if I can learn to do that, maybe I can learn French. Uh, I went to a school in, in inner London where there was a breakfast club which Charles to Shine had set up, and there were a group of kids playing. Uh, there was a girl uh, from a Caribbean origin batting. She was being, the bowler was someone with a Muslim dress. 
and the fielder on the boundary was a white English kid. And not one of these people, for the slightest bit, took any notice of the fact that they were of different color, different ethnic origin, different religion. They were just playing cricket together. And that's the way to overcome differences in our society and show people that we have much more in common than we have differences. And what, a, what a terrifically positive way to finish our conversation. Uh, Lord King, I'm very grateful to you for taking part. Thank you very much indeed. It's been my pleasure, Gary, and St George's House does wonderful work and I'm proud to be associated with it. Thank you. And let me just finish by thanking all of you who have tuned in uh, tonight. There were many questions coming through on the chat. I couldn't get through them all. I promised Lord King we'd be finished by 7.45 and I've already broken that promise, I'm afraid. But thank you for tuning in uh, and I hope you'll be able to join us for future conver conversations over the coming months. Thank you, uh, Lord King. Thank you to our audience and good night.